Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. Rather than go chase the requirements with a user, which many commercial companies do, design for flexibility in your architecture. You will always find a user who will say, yes, I want what you're building, but it doesn't give you any indication of product market fit. That only comes through the budget war, and you have to have been through a lot of them to really understand how hard it is to know, do you have product market fit from a budget war perspective? But the more flexibility that a drone company designs in their architecture, is it easily upgraded? Can you have external navigation solutions? How many different apertures does it have for communications? Can it take multiple different frequency inputs from a antenna perspective? Things like this prevent the person in the budget war from saying, can your solution do X? And if the answer is no, then you're done. And defense primes are used to having to sometimes wait out a comeback next year response. For startups, that's really difficult to do. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Vertical Space. First, thanks to everyone for your positive comments about The Vertical Space podcast. It's great hearing your feedback. It's funny, this past weekend, I was at an industry dinner on Friday night and how terrific it was to have people come up and say how much they enjoy our conversations on the podcast. Listen, we're delighted you like the guests we're speaking with and you think that they have provided you some unique insight, but I'm sure there's a lot we can be doing better. So if there are guests you'd like to hear from, or if there are things you'd like us to do better, let us know and check out our new website. You can send us a note via the vertical space.net. So you can see all the podcasts, you can see the guests, you can see a little bit more about Luca, Peter and me. So uh, check it out and you can send us a note from there. We'd love to hear from you. This week's guest is Dr. Will Roper. Will is a physicist and foreign policy strategist who served as the 13th Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, overseeing procurement for the U.S. Air Force and Space Force from 2018 to 21. How do I begin describing our talk with Will? For our business innovators, you must listen to how he talks about how you should view the Pentagon as a market. Listen to his discussion about how to work with the government and what is possible in large bureaucratic organizations. This is a trip section. And to achieve the possible requires an enormous amount of energy, vision, and motivation to make it happen. It's not the lack of possibility that's the issue. It's the lack of energy. If you're not willing to do that, to provide the energy, vision, and motivation, it won't happen. And that bureaucracies are meant to kill off ideas that don't deserve to exist in the real world. Listen to other recommendations he makes about marketing to the government and the importance of design flexibility. And listen to the types of questions you need to be prepared for when you're looking to work with the government. And with those in smaller companies, the real innovators, some would say, listen to how some in the government view small companies, which is important to know as you build a Defense Department relationship. For those of you who want to know more about Ukraine, you'll enjoy Will's discussion about what the war teaches us about the future of warfare, the real winners in the war, future of warfare is hybrid, with both military and commercial, and how the future of the battlefield will be a combination of Formula One and Ender's Game. We discuss digital transformation and how it brings software like agility to hardware and how it will change mass manufacturing. What I really enjoyed is how digital transformation makes the internet of things we know today as a footnote. Impossible to properly introduce, this discussion is just one you have to jump into and listen to a few times. Thanks Dr. Roper for joining us and to our listeners, happy holidays and enjoy Dr. Roper's talk as you innovate in the vertical space. This episode of the Vertical Space podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access, or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation, and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace.
Dr. Will Roper is an American physicist and foreign policy strategist who served as the 13th Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, overseeing procurement for the U.S. Air Force and Space Force from 2018 to 2021. Before taking office, he served elsewhere within the Department of Defense as founder and director of the Strategic Capabilities Office and prior as the Ballistic Missile Defense System Architect at the Missile Defense Agency. Dr. Roper earned a Bachelor's of Science in Physics and Mathematics from Georgia Tech in 1988. He returned to Georgia Tech to earn his Master's of Physics degree the following year, graduating as a presidential scholar, summa cum laude, in 2002. In 2002, Will was selected as a Rhodes Scholar and began study at University College, Oxford, for a doctoral program in mathematics with a focus on string theory and quantum mechanics. Well, it's a tremendous privilege and joy to have you on the show. Thank you very much, and welcome to the Vertical Space. Thanks, Luca. It's going to be great spending time with you today, and thanks for inviting me. Is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? And here the industry is broadly aerospace or defense. Uh, Luca, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I think uh, it'd be odd, I think, to have someone give you a, an answer that is binary, where you, you think the answer is yes and everyone else thinks no. So I, I think there are quite a few things where the degree to which I believe something isn't fully embraced within industry a couple of things that come to mind are what is possible in a large bureaucratic organization vis-a-vis -vis innovation. I, I hear a lot in industry say what they believe the government is capable of, and they put a cap on it. And my experience within the U.S. government is that almost anything is possible. It just requires an exorbitant amount of energy, vision, and motivation to make it happen. I think so often what, what prevents things from happening isn't a lack of possibility, it's a lack of energy. So I think that's one area. There isn't a ceiling, but if you want to make change in government, and I would, I would extend that to any large organization that has a bureaucracy, if you're not willing to put in the energy to motivate people to add their piece to the pie because no one is holding all of the reins, no one has all of the power. So to make change, you have to have a good idea and you have to motivate people to be involved. And that's good human engineering along with often good engineering if it's a technology initiative. If you're not willing to do that, it's not gonna happen. That's what bureaucracies are meant to do. They're meant to kill off the ideas that don't deserve to live in the real world. So that's one thing that comes to mind. And another is just how far one could go with digital transformation. I think that is an area where the gap between me and the rest of industry will close, especially aerospace and defense industry, as industry leaders become more cognizant of what is possible within digital transformation. I have had the privilege and benefit of getting to experience this both in the public sector when I was leading Air Force and Space Force programs and in the private sector as a consultant for McKinsey. I have seen this happen in action multiple times. And so I see the future as being radically different in an era of digital transformation. I think industry leaders are short selling what is possible because that's where I was when I was first exposed to this new technology, this new capability uh, via McLaren Racing in the UK. It took me a while to get from that early, we're going to save time, we're going to save money, we're going to save environmental impact to seeing this as a new industrial revolution. So those are two things that come to mind. If we zoom out to a global perspective, what are some of the key geostrategic forces today that are acting on the aerospace industry, on the defense aerospace industry, perhaps, that many are not aware of enough? Well, it's, it's a mix of ones where they probably are aware, but it still behooves us to say them anyway, and, and maybe others that are, are less in the spotlight. Certainly long-term, the relationship of the U.S. with China and the competition that we will enter into, that we are, are in, but I guess are entering into a new phase of on the other side of, of events in Ukraine. 
that is going to guide the aerospace and defense industry. How could it not? It's the most important challenge for our time. And I am not a fatalist on the relationship between the U.S. and China. I, I hope for the best, but events both inside of China and out lead me to believe the best strategy is to prepare for the worst, and that is for a long competition where the stake of the U.S.'s role, and I would argue our allies and partners' role in the world is at play, and that the world needs us to come out on top of, uh, of this competition. Now, our, our system isn't perfect, but I think it's a lot better than the one that China would create uh, were they uh, in the leading role in the world. So that is going to shape how the aerospace and defense industry goes. It's only a piece of the competition with China, but it's an important piece because it undergirds a lot of the other forms of soft power and diplomacy that will take place at a nation state level. I think there is going to be a dangerous tendency for the Pentagon to pull up Cold War thinking and even if they don't use the term Cold War, which I doubt they will, they will use the same thinking and most of the same playbook, and that would be very dangerous. That may be a, an area to unpack during this podcast. Another force that's going to guide uh, these industries are lessons learned on the other side of events in Ukraine. Certainly horrible to watch what, what we're seeing on TV, but also inspiring to see what the Ukrainian people and forces are able to do against this larger aggressing Russian force that's invading their homeland. It's, it's energized defense. It's energized young people to see national security differently. And as I engage in one of my roles as a, as a professor at Georgia Tech, I'm getting to see young people that haven't really thought of national security and their engagement with it as engineers, as technical people, getting to see that evolve because of what they're seeing on TV. And it really takes me back to, to my days when I was a student at Georgia Tech and I watched 9-11 happen on the news. I still remember being sent home from the gym when the first aircraft hit. And that woke me up to new security challenges I had never considered. I'd never thought about violent extremism and its origins going all the way back to the Cold War, but much further than that. And it guided my career in a way that I don't think would have happened um, had that not occurred. And I think the same thing may happen with events in Ukraine, that we will see a bumper crop of young people that feel that national security is a calling, not just a job. And it'll, it'll uh, be a bigger influence than just that, than just recruitment. It's certainly going to have government officials trying to garner lessons learned, to look at conflict in a different lens because of what we're seeing, this first, this first networked conflict where commercial technology and military technologies are creating a, a hybrid form of power projection, but one that is not being uh, easily countered by the aggressing Russian forces. There are lessons to learn, and this could guide the industry as well. And finally, the thing that I don't think is in the spotlight as much as it should be, and it shocks me that it isn't, are the lessons learned on the other side of COVID, which I went through as the Air Force and Space Force acquisition executive, I am still blanking that part of my memory and what may be a little PTSD because there was no playbook for keeping the Air Force and Space Force ready to fight on every given day during a pandemic. And right. States were shutting down their businesses and workforces in a mercurial left and right way every day it was a new crisis that forced herculean efforts on the part of of men and women in those two services to to keep the supply chains running raw material access production capacity running so that we were able to fight and win on any given day and if we weren't able to do that, had we not succeeded in doing that, then there's your playbook 
for holding the U.S. at risk, wait for another disaster or a pandemic or a period when domestically we're distracted and, and then attack. But I'm, I'm proud to say that didn't happen. But nothing that was done using the Defense Production Act and wasn't even aware of that before COVID hit. Had to learn about it and had to learn how to manage supply chains and interact with with them that were from medical, pharmaceutical, N95 masks, which I knew nothing about, and neither did many of the men and women in the Air Force. But we learned, but we learned the hard way. And what I thought would happen on the other side of COVID is a reckoning nationally where we would require a more uh, ready posture, a more alert posture, ready for the, the unknown, the unforeseen. And I don't believe that's happened. We, we're, we've all been ready to get back to normal. And it, it certainly is feeling like that in the nation. And I think that's good medicine for everyone. But getting back to normal doesn't mean getting back to where we were. And it surprises me that we haven't started the discussion at a national level, and certainly aerospace and defense play a part of this, of how can we be more ready the next time? And certainly pivoting back to the Ukraine, supply chains are first and foremost on the battlefield, keeping access to U.S. and NATO equipment uh, as, as a means to project power. And then that reaches back into our ability to produce them. And then we also see that on the Russian side, their difficulty in projecting power and keeping access to critical supplies and logistics uh, that are being contested by the Ukrainian forces. So supply chain matters, right? It, it, is, it is as important as bombs on the battlefield. It is the, the fuel of markets, and it's no longer something that's just mentioned by those who do it in a company or in a government. It's a CEO boardroom, uh, secretary of the Defense Department or military department issue now. But I think, I think it hasn't gotten the spotlight uh, that it deserves this quickly, and I, I hope that it does before the next unforeseen thing happens. And we ask ourselves, why didn't we take the first event, namely COVID, as a wake-up call? Well, to what extent did the war in Ukraine either validate or not validate some of the assumptions that you and, and others in the DOD held previously? I, I think it validated what most people in the Pentagon who thought deeply about the future of warfare thought. But don't take that to mean that because it was thought that there was any change to how the militaries are postured to project power because of it. But let me, let me separate those two issues in terms of the thinking. The idea of, of anti-access aerial denial challenges on a battlefield has been talked about and written about for decades now. It's Clausewitz at its origin, hold centers of gravity at risk. And during complex engagements on the battlefield that don't just involve the forces, they involve the logistics and supply chain that feed them. They involve the communications that enable them. They involved the navigation solutions that help them find their way that you would hold the enablers at risk and not just the fighting forces themselves. In fact, holding the enablers at risk is a much better strategy and, and many orders of magnitude. So we're just simply seeing that thinking in Ukraine that, that holding enablers at risk is a good idea. We're also seeing another idea that has been talked about and written about for at least a decade, uh, maybe more, and, and certainly I, I was one that was a big champion of this. Uh, in my role working for, uh, for Secretary Ash Carter, my job was to get ready for a fight with China and Russia, and we, we built a lot of systems in the Strategic Capabilities Office to do that. Uh, but one of the things that gave me hope in that endeavor is that we didn't just have to evoke military systems to be ready. We could leverage commercial 
technology and commercial capabilities too. And we often talked about uh, the difficulty of fighting the world for any one aggressor, that taking on the world of commercial satellite imagery, in addition to U.S. imagery, is a much more you know challenging predicament to put an adversary into, a, a horns of the dilemma, uh, for sure, than just taking on military capabilities alone. And the same thing for communication and synthetic aperture radar and all the other burgeoning commercial fields that we see having an impact on the battlefield. Commercial industry, the startup ecosystem that didn't, that didn't begin as a, as a defense-oriented entity, but one that is more dual-use in nature. I'm a technology-driven entity, but I want to work in both the public sector, namely national security markets, as well as the private sector. They may not be creating the, the booms on the battlefield, but they are creating a lot of the information that allows those booms to happen. They're having a, a, an incredible impact that the Pentagon should, should recognize. That's a hybrid approach to the industrial base that we have talked about for decades. So we're simply seeing old thinking play out. Now, what I would pivot to was the second point I made. That doesn't mean that the Pentagon really changed the way it does business. Uh, it has not embraced getting rid of its dependence on critical enablers as much as it should. It is still critically dependent on space and comm and navigation. And it knows this. But it's just easier to go another day getting the benefits of those enablers, the, the benefits that made those things exist in the first place. And, and secondly, we haven't embraced commercial technology, commercial capital as much as, much as we should. We've been tourists there for the most part in the Pentagon. And in the Air Force, when I moved over from the Strategic Capabilities Office to run the Air Force programs, I didn't want to be a tourist. So I tried to make our commercial outreach organization called AFWorks a part of the acquisition engine itself connected to operators who are the real indication of product market fit, not just contracts. I wanted to know for real would operators go fight for the capabilities that they had in the budget. And yes, the budget is a fight. It's the ultimate fight in the Pentagon. Right. So I wanted to I wanted to to see if we would start walking the walk in addition to talking the talk on bridging bridging, you know, ourselves with the private sector. And I was really impressed with what the Air Force did, but it's only done half of the story which is bringing the companies in, validating product market fit with, with earnest money that is not dedicated for them. But the final chapter is to see, will that early product market fit, that early earnest money that could have been spent on anything but was spent on startups, does that translate to recurring revenue? And, and that's now a job for others to take up. And if there's no recurring revenue, then in future, what people are going to look back on is they're going to say, look, the Air Force, I think more than any other service, brought thousands of startups in. Many of them had a significant impact on the battlefield in Ukraine, but almost none of them moved to recurring revenue. So the Pentagon is a cul-de-sac. It's easy to get in and you can drive around, but there's ultimately no place to go. And in future companies that, that found themselves, I, I think we'll say we can go get R&D money from the Pentagon and maybe that's useful, but it's not a market. It's just simply a dead end. Will, what has the war in Ukraine taught us about the role of relatively small numbers of large, exquisite weapons platforms versus smaller, more numerous weapons systems that are ultimately enabled by the same technologies. What has it this war taught us about the respective roles of those going forward? You know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that question uh, about capability mix in Ukraine, because I see people talking 
either side of the issue. And I, I think it validates it validates almost everyone who had an opinion on how to have a, a mix of capabilities and a mix of industrial bases uh, supporting them. The first thing that I, I see is that without the established defense industrial base, there are not going to be things blowing up on the battlefield. Right? That th Those systems that are going in, HIMARS and, and others, are having a significant impact, like Javelin missiles, which I was, I, I, when I go back to my, uh, my days in the Pentagon, I really wanted to, to give javelins to, to all of NATO and Ukraine. I, I really wish that fight had ended up uh, being won because it'd be interesting to see how events would have been different had systems been in place from the, from the very get-go. But these systems are having a huge impact. And, and without them, who knows how things would be going. And it takes a long time to be able to create a weapons line to deal with sensitive and insensitive munitions and to keep them safe uh, for use, obviously, but safe for transport and, and, and safe for uh, ingressing and egressing. I mean, that's not trivial stuff, and our defense industrial base does it well. But equally, we see the power of drones that are playing, uh, playing out on both sides. Most of this is commercial technology. We're seeing the platform that should bring autonomy and AI into the battlefield. Those drones are demanding to have greater autonomy so that we can connect them from uh, high bandwidth communications and navigation solutions in space that can be contested through jamming and other means. So, so I think, and we're also seeing huge enablement from commercial companies that are providing communications, synthetic aperture radar, imagery. And without this, the, the weapons don't know where to go. The drones don't know where to fly other than just you know, trying to find things on their own. The, the future of warfare is hybrid. We are not going to go into the battlefield without defense unique kit, and we're not going to go in without commercial kit either. We're going to have both. So as I watch people argue one side or the other, the, the real work should be in figuring out a balance that makes sense. If there's one thing that I think will win on the other side of events in Ukraine, and other than the Ukrainian forces, which I cross fingers and toes for every day, it's going to be drones. Uh, they have had their moment and this is different than the reapers and predators that we've all gotten accustomed to for fighting violent extremism. I mean, those are drones in a word, but they're still remotely piloted and have more people crewing them than many of our crewed systems that have a pilot in them. I, I think on the other side of events in Ukraine, uncrewed systems with a higher degree of autonomy that are at unprecedentedly low price points compared to the things they hold at risk are going to have the limelight. And when I think about the future of the U.S. military, it seems like a perfect construct for projecting power for, say, the U.S. Army to be able to put up thousands, tens of thousands of, of low-cost, autonomous, smart, networked drones that, hmm. that darken the sky and that you can't hide from and that learn together as a collective. And you can still have people be in the loop, but get all the benefits of, of what autonomy and artificial intelligence can do. You could imagine uh, you know, a Tesla-like grid where, where they're all learning together and sharing information. And the price point of that would be less than, than many of our, our major defense acquisition programs, even one of them. A billion dollars in the space of low-cost drones could have an unprecedented scale of capability and responsiveness of capabilities that have never been enjoyed before on the battlefield. And the solution that I, I think it'll provide will be to the problem of time-critical targeting, 
which has always been a difficult challenge in an anti-axis area denial area, which is where we started, you know, talking about what have we learned in Ukraine? Well, anti-axis area denial is real, and you should try to be as, you know, as, as uh, decoupled from it as you can be. Well, anti-axis area denial, one of the challenges that, that, it, that it exploits is that time-critical targeting is hard. It's hard to find a target that's trying to keep you from finding it. And then you have to keep custody of the target. You have to keep eyes on it through some means because weapons don't show up instantaneously. And by the time the weapon shows up, you know, 10, 20 minutes later, which is as fast as it's going to be, uh, that target has had a lot of time to try to hide again. That's a hard problem. Drones offer a new solution to that problem because of the intelligence that they can provide at the edge for a price point that can be scaled to cover area. Now, it'll be interesting to see, does the Pentagon actually do anything about that? They'll write about it, they'll talk about it, but will it change the kind of things that they buy? Will it change the force structure mix? Of the commercial organizations that are listening right now, the innovators, the, the drone companies, what could they do different to take advantage of the opportunity that you're talking about? What kinds of organizations, what kinds of technology, what would you recommend to our innovators that they focus on? Well, I mean, the first thing, if the Pentagon doesn't choose to open itself up and quit being a cul-de-sac, the only thing that commercial drone companies can do is, is really use their connections in Congress to lobby and put pressure on the executive branch from, from the legislative. That's why we have the system of government we do. That's something that I, I think m many commercial companies don't do as much as they should. It's how our system of government works. No part of the government <laughs> gets it right on its own. It needs the others to check and upgrade and encourage them to do the right thing. But assuming that happens and the cul-de-sac turns into a, a street that has a destination, the thing I would encourage them to do is to, rather than go chase the requirements with a user, which many commercial companies do, design for flexibility in your architecture. You will always find a user who will say, yes, I want what you're building, and, but it doesn't give you any indication of product market fit. That only comes through the budget war, and you have to have been through a lot of them to really understand how hard it is to know do you have product market fit from a budget war perspective. But the more flexibility that a drone company designs in their architecture, is it easily upgraded? Can you have external navigation solutions? How many different apertures does it have for communications? Can it take multiple different frequency inputs from an antenna perspective? Things like this prevent the person in the budget war from saying, can your solution do X? And if the answer is no, then you're done. And that's ultimately how budget wars go. You'll have hundreds of people, and that is not, a, that is not superlative. That's real. Hundreds of people review individual initiatives, sometimes as small as tens of millions of dollars, bringing in their prickly question because their job is to try to not put anything new in the budget. It's effectively what bureaucracy does. No innovation. We're going to buy more of what we bought before, but buy it better. And they're going to ask prickly questions that are meant to stump the briefer. And if the answer to their prickly question is no, <laughs> then they'll say, well, then that sounds like something we need to think about for next year. And defense primes are used to having to sometimes wait out a comeback next year response. For startups, that's really difficult to do. So the best way to insulate yourself is to try to have a flexible architecture in your design so that the answer is, is always yes. And that doesn't mean you get through, but it means you live, you, you live to fight another day. And that's how you up your probability of, of getting into the budget from a, a recurring revenue perspective. Will, do you think that we're headed towards the defense industry landscape with several new defense primes emerging, or 
will the relevance and the defensibility and the power of, of existing primes continue to increase? It's hard. I mean, there. Are, it's hard to say. I, I I would hope that we're moving towards a world where we don't have to create any new defense primes. The defense primes are the result of global and governmental forces at work on the defense industrial base uh, in the Cold War to today. And if we could back up, I think many people would say, we don't want those forces to do to our defense industrial base what it did. So before I tell you what the future's like, probably worth just telling viewers like wh what happened and, and what was it like before? You know, before we have the major defense primes of today, we had specialized companies in the defense industrial base. You, you could be just an airplane company or a ship company or a ground vehicle company or anything company, and you could work with the Pentagon. When the Air Force was founded, you know, over 70 years ago, there were 13 companies who could build tactical airplanes for the Air Force. And now it's down to just a handful, you know, two or three. So specialization was alive and well. But what happened in the latter part of the Cold War is the military computerized its systems first. It went through complicated system of systems integration before that happened commercially. In fact, the Pentagon made the long lead investments in deep tech that led to the information age, you know, micro processors, satellites, uh, high gain antennas, and, and even the internet itself are, are defense investments and, and significant investments over time to de-risk those technologies. So, so it had to computerize and network when computers were still really hard and really expensive and not that great. Uh, compared to anything we have today, but they were great for the time. So defense programs really slowed down and the price really went up. And I'm not saying that things couldn't have been better, but, but maybe it was inevitable that that slowdown and raise in cost created massive consolidation, mergers, mergers and acquisitions, because the, the, the space between programs of a similar kind got to be bigger and bigger and bigger until it became generational. Right. The Air Force just unveiled the, the B-21, which is awesome to see. I mean, I've seen it many times, but now it's great that the public can see it. And it was great to, you know, to be part of that program during a very critical time. The three years that I was involved with it were very, very critical times for the program uh, to keep it on track. So it, it's great uh, that, that that ended up coming to pass. And it's going to be a great bomber for the nation but this is a bomber that's now being created 30 years plus after our last stealth bomber. And when will the next stealth bomber be built? Well, if we don't change how we do business a generation later, this generational capabilities means that you can't be a bomber company and work for the U.S. Air Force. You only get to build one once every 30 years, and that's if you win. So you have to build everything. And it, that didn't happen overnight. You know, there was consolidation within aviation, but that has now happened to consolidation everywhere. And the defense primes build a little bit of everything. And I don't think many people would wake up and said, say, I want to start a business that builds a little bit of everything because that amount of scope doesn't let you specialize and specialization tends to lead to excellence. So what I would really like to see is I'd like to see specialization come back to the industrial base. And that specialization should come back in the form of dual-use companies. But dual-use companies will need a different approach to engaging the acquisition and procurement system. And they're going to need a more predictable approach for product market fit and recurring revenue than the current budget battle process that happens on a two-year basis affords. So, so, Will, if we look at a future of more companies bringing specialized capabilities to their defense customer. Do you see that future looking like a pathway where startups can work directly with the Department of Defense, even in the later stages of their program? Or do you see a continuing role for existing defense primes to look like partners to those startups? And, and what does that alignment 
look like? Where does it work? Where does it not work? It'll end up being both. For certain commercial companies, they'll be able to work directly with the Defense Department if it's a mission where the commercial analog and the defense analog are almost the same. And there are many areas of defense, which is a, a huge encompassing field. There are many areas where that's the case. Logistics, for instance, maintenance, for instance. So you can be a company and work directly with the Pentagon. But for creating new kinds of capabilities, I think in the next chapter in the book that I hope is written, there should be the ability for startups to work with the primes in a way that is that is win-win. I have encouraged, I am continuing to encourage the defense primes to do that. But the defense primes are used to working with each other and it's a frenemy kind of relationship because the, they may be partnering on one thing, but they're competing on other things. They may even be competing with part of what they're partnering on. So it's a very complicated world. That leads to lots of contractual uh, language to defend their equities, which is a non-starter for startups. Multiple primes are trying to crack the code. I don't think anyone has, but whichever one does first, I think it's a winning strategy for them to bring in startup innovation as part of their P1 calculus in new business capture. Well, given that our audience, are, again, are innovators, entrepreneurs at the intersection of tech and flight, you've been responsible for the Air Force research development acquisition activities. What unexpected insights came out of this position in terms of how quickly and significantly technology is impacting flight? Well, from, from my time in the, in the Air Force and Space Force, a lot of it was spent with commercial companies from the startup ecosystems around the nation. And what I learned was that, <laughs> is that even our paperwork and contractual process would be the limb fact on how fast innovative solution could come in. Most of our processes in government would have to fundamentally change to harness commercial innovation in a way that was win-win. And so a lot of what I did was try to change the process itself so that we were a more efficient machine. So that, that was my lesson learned. And I, what was really cool to see uh, as we did events like pitch days, which continue to this recording, they're still doing pitch days in the Air Force, which is where commercial innovators get to pitch the, the customers directly and be on contract immediately if it's successful. It's, it's very much like a demo day or, or pitch day construct in private industry. But that's as much, those were created by me as much for helping teach the government what is possible externally as it is to give those external innovators a chance to be on stage and, and tell the government what they can do. There's still a, a tendency in the government to think small business equals small impact. I hear that from government leaders to this day, both officially and unofficially. But what I know of these government leaders, if they think that, is that they have been in Washington for too long. They have not gotten out and, and sat down with companies who are not just building applications for phones, which is the pejorative I sometimes hear from a, a consummate bureaucrat. Startups are now innovating in, in hardware and deep tech just as much as software. And so what government leaders should do is... is is look for an area where commercial needs are aligned with government needs or closely aligned. And that's an area where it can expect huge value, but it'll have to change the process even more than I was able to change to truly unlock what the private sector can do. And there are many caveats and provisos to what I've just said, because security is a real challenge. Uh, it is, and you can't just waive it but it's not an excuse either. It can be, it can be dealt with, it can be worked through. And, and so you've got to get past that and get on to the business of doing business. Well, it's, it's interesting how you called Pentagon a cul-de-sac. Can we spend a little bit more time talking about the challenges for startups to engage the DOD and for entrepreneurs to build truly dual use companies? 
It is a cul-de-sac in that the path to recurring revenue, it just hasn't been trailblazed at scale. I mean, we have SpaceX, we have Palantir, but you know these are these are exceptional companies with with exceptional founders who had the ability to pressurize the government in a way that an, an average startup, and I don't mean that average in terms of their potential, but just average in terms of the resources that they have to bring to bear, uh, can bring. So, what does what does being a cul-de-sac mean? Well. One, I've had many startups uh, since I've left government will say, hey, I've got a contract, even with the Air Force, even with my organization, I've got a contract with AFWorks. Great. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a good first step, but it doesn't mean you've got product market fit. It doesn't. And then I'll sometimes have companies say, well, I've, I've, I've sat down with users and they've told me they really need this and I'm really working on something that matters to them doesn't mean you have product market fit. Product market fit is a complicated thing in the government because of how complicated the budgeting process is. If you're a founder, an innovator at a startup and you're listening to this, you have many different funding sources that you can go to in the world of private investment. You can go see Luca, you can go see others in this space. And if any one of them likes what you're doing after their diligence, you're funded. But there's only one U.S. Congress, and there are hundreds of people between good ideas and final funding, and most things don't make it. So, so what 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 we did in the Air Force to try to begin the process of establishing product market fit, and it was was create AFWorks, but not just create an organization, which most government uh, government people like to do. Let's create another another office. But we tried to create a process that starts building towards fit, but it needs to be completed. It's just the beginning. So you can have a, a like a phase one contract with AFWorks. There are thousands of those that are granted every year. It is not an indication that you have product market fit, but it gets you in the door. And now you can start getting like your commercial speak into government speak because you've got a contracting officer that you can work with. And You've got a, a more official form of communication because you are a defense contractor, even with a small 50 to 150K uh, contract. The next phase, phase two, which those are typically in a few million in size, has the ability to start bringing in matching dollars from a program executive who represents the user. So these, these are the people who buy B-21s and other things. They buy the big stuff in a military department. They have big budgets. Uh, their budget is not a startup budget. It's not a small business budget like the Small Business Innovative Research uh, funds are. So if they put money in a matching contract with AFWorks towards a startup, that's beginning to make the case that there may be product market fit for that idea. Because Aside from the money that is fenced only for investment type opportunities, you got real doing business money from the service. And as you move from those early investments up to the larger Stratfi investments that can have, you know, that can be as large as 60 million total, those Stratfis will have 15 million of matching investments from a program executive and their user community. 15 million is real money. I had a lot of desperation days in the Air Force trying to find 15 million to patch holes in programs, especially as we would, would be in the, the doldrums of the fiscal year. 15 million is real money that solves real problems. So to get that level of money is a really strong indication that you have product market fit. But all of this is R&D money. Typically, the, the way this story concludes is that after you have a bigger investment like that from the Air Force, if you successfully complete the contract, you should transition into a recurring revenue program. You've had the money to, to you know, to de-risk. And so for the people who know the term valley of death, you know, I think the Air Force did a, did a good thing and that AFWorks team did a good thing 
and creating tier contracts where there's finally enough money to get across the valley of death. But now the work that remains is if you actually succeed, do you actually win your way through the budget war, through the prickly questions uh, to recurring revenue and a, and a procurement contract or an ops and sustainment contract? And if that starts happening in numbers, then that's going to be an awesome thing, not just for those companies. It's going to be an awesome thing for this nation because it will start building a bridge between the dot-com tech ecosystem and the dot-mill ecosystem. And if we can't find a way to create synergy between them, China has a unified strategy, you know, civilian military fusion. They're bringing everything they can in one package. And if we don't, we'll be dividing and conquering ourselves. Well, we often hear from software entrepreneurs how they agonize over the difficulty of selling software to the DOD. What is the DOD's acquisition strategy when it comes to software and what would be some good words of advice for those entrepreneurs? Well, I feel your pain <laughs> if you're one of those companies. I got to run around with with Eric Schmidt when I was in the strategic capabilities office for for about four years. So I really got to mind meld with him on software, which was great. And when I came into the Air Force, the reason why software acquisition was poor historically was pretty evident to me. I already had views from Eric about you know, needing to move to agile development methodologies and DevSecOps and start adopting zero trust. The technology, I, was, I felt really in sync on, but once I joined the Air Force, software just wasn't viewed as cool. It was viewed as this like lesser thing. Like if you were involved with a software program, it meant that like somehow you lost out to those who were involved with like weapons or airplanes. And so the first thing the Air Force needed was just a reckoning to just, you know, treat software with the respect it deserves, right? It, it is the power in, in the world currently. It is the most important thing in the world currently, and the military needs to treat it that way. So that cultural reckoning, which created a lot of these different software factories with sci-fi names like the, you know, the Kessel Runs and Kobayashi Maru's, if you're a Star Trek fan, that just started five years ago. So it, it takes time for culture to go all the way through and for some of those early leaders in a culture shift to become senior leaders that can, that can make what they do establishment. So if you're having trouble, at least with the Air Force or Space Force, it's, it's still in this metamorphosis from software being old and dull to software being the, the new hip cool thing. And the second thing I'll say to tie off this is that you can, you can make it as easy or as, or as hard as you want. If the government throws the book at you, every single cybersecurity regulation that exists, then uh, you're never going to get through. And, and I hate to tell you that, but you, it is so formidable that only a defense prime with 10 years of patience could possibly make it through all of the, you know, like, and, and I'm not just talking about like, you know, NIST 800.53 or, or 171, 172 compliance. I'm, I'm talking about the full set of cybersecurity requirements that would be expected for a classified program is formidable, but most of it is waivable. So it's, it's, it's as easy or as hard as the government is willing to be based on the government's ability to take risk. So how do you engage with the government if you need them to be flexible with you on something that you can't change because it would bifurcate your product between you know, the public sector and private? So you need to help those government officials you're talking to understand the risk they're taking. And that may mean putting your technology in good old fashioned plain English so that they can go explain it to a lawyer who has to determine do they are they properly using the authority to make whatever exceptional decision you need? Um, a lot of times, commercial companies come in to sell the government. Don't sell to the government. You 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 just don't 
have the background to do it. Just try to equip the government. Help that government official understand how your technology works. Be very honest on risk. Be very honest on opportunity. Equip them to go have those governmental discussions that have to be had. And when you equip those government leaders, if your technology is interesting and inspiring and, and could have value, that's why they're there. Most people who are in government, they want to make a difference, but they're trapped in a system where that's difficult. So the more you equip them, the more likely they're going to be to, to take that extra step. If you go in and you sell them, which sell them, I mean, is like a little, little slicker, maybe not quite, not, you're not saying anything that's not true, but maybe you're not sharing quite the level of transparency you would, like internal to your team versus external. I think that's a losing strategy with most mm -hmm. government officials. Right. So well, speaking of equipping, so we have on the commercial side, you know, billions have been invested in advanced air mobility, you know, drones, VTOL, electric aircraft. And as they listen to this podcast, let's say you're going to put together a pitch day and say, okay, you companies who've developed these things, here are the technology gaps that exist on the DOD side that you guys could potentially address. What technology gaps exist today that those on the commercial side of advanced mobility may be able to address? A lot of what I'm going to say, companies are working on. We were excited in the Air Force to have companies that were working on electric aviation and hybrid aviation and vertical takeoff and landing technology. And you know, full, full disclosure, I, I, when I left the Air Force, I joined the, the board of Beta because I, yeah. I, I thought they were doing a great job in this space. That's the kind of specialized company that the U.S. military wants back in its industrial base, at least, at least a certain uh, demographic does in the Pentagon. And I was certainly one of them. Like we want specialized companies to be able to work with the military on their way to commercial success and not have to go, uh, you know, acquire a jet company, a bomber company, a mobility platform, a tank, you know, build every possible aircraft under the sun because the electric aircraft will only come about once every 30 years. Right. That it just sounds stupid to say all that. But that's, that's what you have to do, at least today, to build airplanes for the U.S. Air Force. You have to be able to build a little bit of everything. So it's companies like that that really got us excited. And it, they're doing exactly what they should be doing, which is building a system that can meet commercial needs. Primarily, that's its focus, but can also meet military needs so that the government can buy that system with the benefit of those commercial market forces driving it, driving its capabilities forward, its, its price point down. That's exactly what, uh, what many people in the government want to see. I think a lot of uh, people in the government have a tough time, though, squaring the circle on ideas like that because they'll look at where, say, the you know, advanced air mobility market is today and they'll say, hey, Will, why are you so excited about this market? It, it's not going to revolutionize the way we go fight a war today. There's nothing wrong, and, and people should be thinking about how to be ready and optimized to fight a war today. It could happen. But when I look at an emerging market like air mobility, I think, well, it, it's not going to replace fighters or, or bombers, but if with enough time to mature, could it change the way we do logistics, security, special operational forces on the battlefield? Absolutely. That matters. Any one of those could be a winning thing on a future battlefield, but even that is smaller in comparison to whether or not the U.S wins or loses the race to that market. And I don't think the Pentagon's comfortable with what I'm saying right now, that it should treat emerging markets as a battlefield, even if the impact they have on actual battlefields could be decades away. But I think it needs to make those investments or the markets may move overseas. And in the case of like 
hobbyist drones, I guess the, the inattention of the U.S. government took a technology that was created by U.S. companies and, and it has now all globalized overseas, uh, mostly to DJI in China. That's what happens when you don't engage an emerging market as a battlefield. You may lose it altogether. Air mobility is going to be a big market. I believe that. So, so I want to put, that's something that I, I just, I, I think it's going to be a big philosophical debate. Does the Pentagon start battling for markets? And then for the companies listening in this, the, the, the thing that I would ask you to think about is, in addition to thinking of the Pentagon as a funding source, you know, think of it as a little mini market. That's your best way to engage it for your benefit is that in addition to buying things, and it buys them at a higher price point than, than the commercial market, it also operates at a higher risk point than the commercial market, but it also has its own regulatory and certification system. And, and, and there, the military is innovative. It's world leading in its creativity. Now that, that may sound a little odd because we're used to the government always being behind everything else, but just take the U.S. Air Force, for example. What it does is certify things to fly that have never flown before, right? There's a B-21 bomber unveiled, right? I mean, it's an aircraft of a class that's never existed before. But no one's questioning whether or not the Air Force is going to get it to fly or whether they'll be able to certify it. That's just what it does. So in the space of air mobility, where I think the, the government partnership will really shine if it continues, here's from recent reports to Congress that, that it may, is, is in de-risking certification so that commercial civilian markets can follow the military's playbook. So that's, I think that's part of the formula of a hybrid workforce is figuring out where, where does this unique military market, governmental market, where does it have synergy with the commercial market? And then in terms of what technologies, you know, do, do you need to bring to bear? Almost any technology that you are working on will have an impact on military missions. The military mission covers almost everything. In fact, I... I doubt you could mention a technology that I would say has no military uh, impact. I, I spent a full day having to review sanitization of hospital blankets for the Defense Department. So never thought I would spend a day on that. Spent a day on that. So the military's mission. <laughs> That's some good is, times. <laughs> military's mission is broad. <laughs> right. One of your opening re remarks were that most don't understand how far one can go in digital engineering. What is possible within digital engineering today that has previously been out of reach? And how does that change the things that we have been talking about so far? The thing that's exciting about digital engineering is no one knows. It is a it is a field in flux and it is an exciting field to be in, but one that is misunderstood, I believe, because of how ubiquitous computers are in a pre-digital transformation phase. Computers are everywhere. So it's very easy for companies or organizations to say, I'm already doing digital engineering. So the answer to your question is no one knows, and that's what makes it exciting. But what I, what I believe is possible with digital transformation is I believe that we will begin by seeing what Formula One racing does today, that is, that is science fact today, but science fictional elsewhere. I think we will start seeing that as status quo, where the overwhelming majority of design, test, and certification is digital. That we'll see that, that two, we'll see when physical things exist, that they're conjoined to their digital twin, and that, that one improves the other, and that we'll see this eye-blistering pace of innovation and upgrade. You know, the Formula One today, if, you, if we were to start a company and we wanted to be competitive in Formula One, we would need to design at least 30 to 40,000 digital cars per year, roughly 1,000 or more for every racetrack. 
We would be doing the same for our competitions, cars, and drivers to try to find the minutia of advantage that are needed to be a good company over the long haul. When we do decide to go from that myriad of, of digital cars to a physical one for a specific racetrack, we would heavily instrument it and stream back all of the data to be able to you know, do race day optimization, but also improve our models for the future. And by the time we would finish the season, the car that would finish it would look nothing like the car that began. It might look like it pictorially, but from an engineering perspective, it would be 85% or more different. It's crazy. Over one racing season, that level of agility, that feels like the agility of software for hardware. That's what digital transformation is. It's Agile methodology is no longer relegated to software. Digital engineering allows it to come into hardware. So that's what I expect will be seen first. What I expect will be seen next is, which doesn't happen in Formula One because you don't mass produce cars, is I think mass production itself is going to change. With advanced turnkey manufacturing, which think Tesla gigafactory like constructs where it's highly automated, sometimes completely automated, modular forms of manufacturing where there are very few people because it's entirely software driven. And where people do exist, they're mostly there to keep the automation and equipment running. That once you can connect it to an agile pipeline of digital designs, why would you mass produce the same thing over and over again? You've got, you've got agile design testing and certification and modular manufacturing, which in its, in its very nature is, is agile. I think we would see the rapidly iterating and improving upgrades of software come into hardware and mass production would start ending as a preferred form of production in many industries. And, you know, industries like the smartphone industry give us a little indication that, that continually upgrading and improving your products uh, is a demand even in expensive hardware driven fields. Now, they're not being built the way that I'm saying, but it gives us an indication, at least gives me an indication that, that that's not a poor hypothesis. The final chapter of this story is that once you've got a digital representation of design, test, certification, manufacturing, even operations and sustainment, which we had in the Air Force, that's a perfect playground for AI to start understanding the physical world. In a way, it can't if you're having to use the physical world itself as a way of producing data. It's why we don't see ubiquitous AI driving around, flying around, operating around the world today is that the, the world's complicated. There are many, many different scenarios that, that algorithms can be exposed to. Self-driving vehicles have one of the hardest challenges of all, given all the variables that could come into play on, on public roads. But once you have a credible simulation that can run faster than real time, that can make mistakes cheaply from both a direct cost and, and, and indirect from like liability perspectives, now you can start training AI to understand the physical world. And we did this in the Air Force, training AI to fly a U-2, uh, which it, AI had never controlled a military system. We we're only able to do that with our simulations. And even more impressively, Team New Zealand's America's Cup team, Team Emirates, built a digital representation of sailing, design, sailing, including all of the human mechanics of, of where you can manipulate the boat. All of that was rendered in integrated models and simulation. They trained an AI to sail using that simulation. But the AI went on to not just, not just sail the way that people had taught it. it. It went on to sail in ways no human had ever thought to sail. It designed boats no human had ever thought to design and then learned to sail them in a way that defied centuries of sailing logic. And Team New Zealand, ultimately, they went from being the trainers of the AI, ultimately had to reverse their role and learn from it. 
which was the whole intent of, of this pursuit for them. And they won America's Cup last year. It didn't really make a lot of press compared to AI winning in chess and go, but to me, AI now being the dominant sailing entity on the planet where humans will never be the best in a boat again, that's newsworthy and a harbinger of other things to come. That's the so what of digital transformation. That so what is huge. It makes the Internet of Things we have today just a footnote hmm. in that future history. When we take a snapshot five years out and ten years out, what does aerospace look like? What do air battles look like? What does aviation technology look like? I'm going to tell you what I hope it looks like. And, and then I think the beginning of this podcast throws enough doubt as to whether <laughs> that will actually happen with all the machinations of governments and large organizations. But I hope it feels like some combination of, of Formula One racing and Ender's Game. Formula One in that I think air battles will be primarily won in the digital realm before the actual battle happens. All of the design, the testing, the preparation, and the iterations on each one of those components and the integration of each one of those components, all of that will be digital. There will be a complete digital battlefield, a complete digital air force, that just like Formula One will, will create the digital entities of, of our adversaries, their digital twins, uh, even down eventually to predilections of individual pilots and operators based on whatever intelligence we have. We will try to create reality as closely as we can, uh, get as close to the matrix as we can in our preparation. Uh, that digital reality will be connected to the physical via a couple of mechanisms. It'll be connected to manufacturing via turnkey manufacturing. I could see us having a very difficult call about when do we go to quote print on a particular aircraft design given war fighting needs because you do have to have physical assets to win a war just like you have to have a physical race car uh, to win a race but there's a payoff for iterating up to the last minute but a huge penalty if you wait too long to go to print to go to production so I think that will be one mechanism that we will see that connects that digital reality to the physical. And the other will be when the physical plane exists, when it's actually on the battlefield with actual pilots, whether they're in, in the system or without. And I do think we will have human operators for any foreseeable future, just not in the same way we do today. Like Formula One, they will be streaming back as much data as communication pipes afford and of course adversaries will try to hold those at risk because we will increasingly put more and more complicated algorithmic decision making on those aircraft and as we do that and know that our opponents are doing the same we will create the exact same kinds of techniques to hold algorithms at risk to thwart them to to challenge their logic in a way that we can go Google search on the internet for the silly mistakes that AI makes today if it's exposed to something it has not been trained to make a decision about. That's going to happen broadly on the battlefield and how quickly you detect those anomalies, get that data back to your digital realm, your digital environment so that you can retrain, redeploy, and feel like that, that whatever that spoofing technique, that algorithmic stealth that you've been exposed to, or algorithmic spoofing, or whatever we call it, that you now are trained to deal with it and the adversary has to move on to something else. That's gonna be happening all the time and maybe even faster than humans can really, can really be involved with. And then finally, like Ender's Game, because I mentioned Ender's Game, I, I think we're just gonna, we're gonna have humans playing a very different role. They're going to be collaborating with uncrewed systems. They're going to build instincts for this form of algorithmic warfare, just like pilots have built instincts for stealth that their predecessors didn't have, like fly towards the radar. That sounds like a dumb idea. 
Now it's a brilliant idea if you're in the right airplane. That kind of instinct is going to increasingly be what makes the good pilots jump from, from the bad. And I think the video game era tells us that if we don't take a lesson from it and give future pilots more and more control of more and more things, push the boundary of where human decision making is adding value to algorithmic decision making, then we'll be on the losing side of that future battlefield. Now, the benefit of everything I've just said is it does not require the U.S. government to go spend a trillion dollars to make it happen. Most of the things I've just mentioned are happening are happening because of commercial gale force forces. Everything I've mentioned, you could imagine an example of it in any industry where, where innovation is happening all the time. Uh, at the edge, back to the center. But so that's awesome. And all that the government has to do for what I've just mentioned is add some awesome airplanes into the mix because there will be awesome airplanes, right? I mean, you know, we're not going to get stealth from commercial industry anytime soon. And unveiling the B-21, hey, there's a role, potentially a powerful role for exquisite airplanes that are mixed into this algorithmic fog especially if that fog is also shared by inexpensive drones and adversaries have to determine what's expensive and what isn't. That's all the government has to do. What's challenging about what I just said is it is almost a 180 from what it has today. Well, uh, I want to ask you what advice you'd give to a, someone starting a business at Advanced Air Mobility, but I'm going to sneak in another question real quick. You mentioned China and you've talked a lot about China. There's been a, some conversation in our podcast about uh, China being a market again for the aerospace industry and for advanced air mobility. Would you recommend that we work more with China on the commercial side like we were before, you know, the last couple of years? The, the answer is yes, with eyes open. Yes, with, with mm -hmm. lots of caveat. We're not going into another Cold War. We're not going to mm -hmm. economically isolate ourselves from China. We want fair access to their market, just like they have had access to our market. Now, based on China's practices, what are we, what are we hopefully rectifying currently? That we have to have uh, the ability to control things like supply chains, especially raw materials, logistics, for instance, uh, that move goods and services around the world, that we can't be crit so critically dependent on China that it becomes a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And that means that we will have to have secondary sources for almost everything that we do, uh, both as governments and companies. And that's just the cost of doing business now. That reliability and resilience have a cost that will take the, the per unit price up. But it will also mean that when that rainy day happens, that may not even be like a uh, a malign action by a nation state. It could just be another pandemic. You've paid for resilience and reliability. And uh, I think I think that now it doesn't sound like lip service. That's something that you can explain to the average person on the street. Yeah. But China is a different beast from in terms of how they view international law, how they view intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just go pretend that it's the rest of the market either. And there's a lot of engagement that's mm -hmm. going to have that happen between U.S. governments and other governments to try to make the playing field more level for companies there. Right now, it is anything but. Let's say you're the next Secretary of Defense and you are going to tell everyone we're going to do one thing really well this coming year. What would it be? It would be to do a snapshot of that future of air warfare that I just discussed. It doesn't have to be in the air domain. It can be in any domain of warfare. But I want to have a physical entity and its digital twin co-evolving together. Because that is indicative of a, a different way of algorithmically fighting warfares and changing decision calculus and shortening the OODA loop in a way that, that just simply extrapolating yeah. from today doesn't allow. I want that. And then I want, I want to not just have fun chasing the technology. I want to change the training pipeline as well. Because once OODA loops, observe, orient, side, act from yeah. John Boyd, once yeah. they're smaller than people can interact, then we're going to have to change how we train people 
to, to deal with that form of warfare. I want to make that happen and then have all the different factions of the government adjust from, from training to readiness to even like contracting and ops and sustainment for mm -hmm. algorithms, all of that classification, all of that will have to change. That's what I would, would do if I had one year to go do something of, of lasting value. That's and terrific. could a demonstration like that be done in a year? It could be. Maybe not as grand as Ender's Game, but in, in miniature, something where a physical and a digital entity evolve could be done in a year. But since it's government work, uh, just give me two. <laughs> okay. All right, so now getting to my real question. So somebody's starting a business in advanced air mobility. What's one piece of advice you would give to them? It's probably advice that's even more general than just advanced air mobility. But if you if you are in advanced air mobility, no, I'm really, really excited about this market. And it's exciting to have the potential for the U.S. to lead it. So thank you. If you're creating a business, uh, I think it's an awesome time to be in, in this area. The thing I would, would encourage you to do is be a clear-eyed embracer of the government market. It, that means fair expectations of what's possible within government, especially in the budgeting side of things, but also em, embrace from a, from a perspective of what that market can do for you from a certification standpoint. I thought one of the biggest things to come out of the Air Force in, in recent months was the Agility Prime report to Congress, where according to, to media coverage of the report, the Air Force committed to procure a small number of, of airplanes to start doing pick a mission. Well, procuring, having that word procure is a huge word. It's much bigger than the space of print that it takes up because it means it'll be bought with procurement dollars, which means that the system will need to get a military flight release and then flight certification, which is likely to be the first certification that's granted for any production asset, just like the first revenue dollars that were granted in air mobility were granted in defense because you could fly for defense for revenue before you could fly uh, domestically, civilly. That's the place where I, I really think the military market will, will, will pay out. And then once there is a commercial market, it'll be much bigger than the military's demand. The military will just buy airplanes and do military-like things with them. But I think early on, uh, navigating certification where your eggs aren't just in civilian cert. And that, I'm not knocking civilian cert. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different, I mean, militaries take risks. That's what militaries do. So it's a different certification. But I had a great, great relationship with the FAA. And, you know, we viewed the role that, that we would play, each would play was an important role in this market. This has been terrific. Uh, that's a great way to wrap up the podcast. Luke, is there anything else from you, sir? Um, not on my end. Peter, do you have any? Not from my end. This has been a fantastic discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Will. You're truly, truly remarkable. Thank you for sharing your insights with us and with our audience. My pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time and for, you know, for all of your viewers. Uh, do, do great things. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general educational and entertainment purposes only.